All right, all right, all right. Now, Bar. Yeah. What's cooler than being cool? Ice Bar. Oh yeah. Hey there, cool kids. Today we're talking about something I know a lot about: being cool. If you're watching this, you probably already know how to be cool. But what about engines, huh? How can an engine be cool? Please tell me how to be cool. Shut up, nerd engine. You'll never be cool. You wear glasses. But get out of here. Ugh. I'm sorry you had to see that, folks. An internal combustion engine is a lot like my inner thighs. It produces a lot of heat. You gotta keep engines from overheating. Sometimes you gotta keep them from freezing. Some people live in places where it freezes. Weird. In that case, you need something to do the opposite of freeze. Some sort of antifreeze. <laughs> antifreeze is also referred to as coolant when it's mixed with water. If you're like me, you may have thought that coolant referred to an ant that has a bunch of tattoos. Well, it doesn't. Coolant is a liquid that prevents your engine from overheating. Wait a minute, saying liquid can keep your engine from overheating and keep your engine from freezing and make you go blind if you drink it? That sounds impossible. But true! You could just use water to cool your engine and it'd do a decent job. But there are more than a few problems with relying on water. One, in extreme heat, it boils over, overheats and damages the engine. And two, in extreme cold, it freezes, expanding and breaking the engine. Antifreeze is a chemical mostly consisting of ethylene glycol or sometimes the lower toxicity propylene glycol. When mixed with water, it serves to lower the freezing point and raise the boiling point of the mixture. It also includes some corrosion inhibitors that are needed to prevent rust from forming on the metal parts like water pumps and engine blocks. When the antifreeze gets brown or rusty in color, that means the inhibitors are broken down and the antifreeze, now just like a pet dolphin that ran away, needs to be replaced. Antifreeze works because the freezing and boiling points of liquid are colligative properties, meaning they depend on the concentrations of solutes or dissolved substances in the solution. A pure solution freezes because the lower temperatures cause the molecules to slow down, allowing the natural attractive forces between them to capture and bind them into rigid crystalline structures. But adding a different kind of molecule to the mix blocks those attractive forces and prevents the crystalline structures from forming. The more solutes that are added, the lower the temperature needs to be before the solution can properly freeze. If you're confused, don't worry. So am I, all the time, about everything. Why am I being filmed? See, when water freezes, it crystallizes and expands like your mom. When water has something dissolved in it, the molecules have to work more to get near each other to crystallize. That extra work to crystallize drops the freezing point. That's why road salt works. It dissolves in water or on contact with snow or ice. And if it dissolves, it breaks up the crystals and makes the crystals harder to form. But salts, even when dissolved in water, can still be hard enough that when they shoot around in a closed system like your engine, they could do damage. Ethylene glycol works great because not only is it water soluble, it's what we call miscible, which means it can be mixed with any amount and still mixed evenly. Antifreeze and water should have a mixture percentage based on the lowest temperatures typically seen in your client. In most regions, they use a 50-50 water antifreeze mixture, which will provide sufficient protection from a little below freezing to a high of 265 degrees. In the coldest temperatures, you could use a mix of 60 to 70% antifreeze. And the color of antifreeze is from a coloring dye, not just the chemical used, but specific colors often mean something differently in the chemical makeup. Main antifreeze colors that you run across are the traditional green, an extended life yellow, an extended life pink or orange. Antifreeze got a specific color. That's so, if it's leaking, you know what it is. Now to see how that antifreeze gets around, let's go inside the engine. You wanna go inside What? Me? No, shut up nerd engine and get out of here before I blow you up. Sorry gang, I gotta take care of that engine. Like I took care of Mr. Carburetor when I found out he stole my kid. You think I wouldn't find out? Calm down, huh? Bart. We didn't talk about this. <laughs> oh. Oh, dear. please, times are tough. Please. Oh. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Coolant flows through a path that takes it from the water pump through the passages inside the engine block where it collects more heat produced by the cylinders. It then flows up to the cylinder head or heads in a V-type engine where it collects more heat from the combustion chambers. Then it flows out past the thermostat 
if the thermostat's opened up to let it pass, through the upper radiator hose and into the radiator. Here, the coolant flows through the thin, flattened hoses that make up the core of the radiator, and it's cooled by the airflow across those fins. The coolant flows out of the radiator, through the hose, and back to the water pump, by this time, cooled off and ready to go grab more heat from the engine. A car's water pumps used to send fluid to the engine block. It's a simple centrifugal pump driven by a belt connected to the crankshaft of the engine. And that uses centrifugal force to send the fluid outside while it spins, making it drawn in from the center continuously. The inlet of the pump is located near the center, so the fluid returning from the radiator hits these pump veins. Pump veins fling the fluid to the outside of the pump where it can enter the engine and there, makes its way through all those passages in the engine and the cylinders, where it returns to the cylinder head of the engine. Thermostats located where the fluid leaves the engine. The plumbing around the thermostat sends the fluid back to the pump directly if the thermostat's closed. If it's open, the fluid goes through the radiator first, and then back to the pump. Thermostats regulating the amount of water that goes through the radiator. Nowadays, a lot of these mechanisms are controlled by computers. The secret to the thermostat used to lie in the small cylinder located in the engine side of the device. The cylinder is filled with a wax that begins to melt at around 180 degrees Fahrenheit. A rod connected to the valve presses into the wax, and when it melts, it expands a bunch, pushing the rod out of the cylinder and opening the valve. That's how turkey thermostats work. Bing! Life hack, if you want to reuse them, put a rubber band around it and let it cool off in your fridge, and then you stick it in whatever turkeys you want. How many turkeys are you cooking? None. One. A year. You probably did it wrong. The radiator essentially takes the heat from the coolant, and it gives it to the air. Most modern cars use aluminum radiators. They're made by brazing thin aluminum fins to flatten aluminum tube. Coolant flows from the inlet to the outlet through all of these tubes mounted in parallel arrangement. Fins conduct the heat, transfer it to the air flowing through the radiator. Sometimes these tubes got a fin inserted called a turbulator, which is what I'm gonna name my first kit. The turbulator increases the turbulence of the fluid flowing through the tubes. If the fluid flowed evenly, only the stuff actually touching the tube would be cooled directly. When you create that turbulence, more fluid is getting cool. Crazy, you guys are so smart. This means more heat's extracted and all the fluid inside the tube is used effectively. All this talk of fluid and tubes reminds me of the lab where I was conceived. Now, the radiator cap itself actually increases the boiling point of your coolant by about 45 degrees. Works the same way a pressure cooker prevents water from boiling. The cap is actually a pressure release valve. And on cars, it's usually set to about 15 PSI. The boiling point of water increases when the water is placed under pressure. It's got nowhere to expand and turn into gas. But water below sea level boils at higher temperature because it's under more pressure from the atmosphere. When the fluid in the cooling system heats up, it expands, so the pressure builds. The cap is the only place where this pressure can escape, so the setting of the spring on the cap determines the maximum pressure in the cooling system. When the pressure reaches that point, it pushes the valve open, allowing coolant to escape from the cooling system and keeping the pressure where it should be. The coolant flows through the overflow tube into the bottom of the overflow tank. This arrangement keeps air out of the system. When the radiator cools back down, it creates a vacuum in the cooling system, pulls open another spring in the loaded valve, and that sucks water back in from the bottom of the overflow tank to replace the water that was expelled. It used to be, you just had a big old fan driven by the engine, cooling all of this off. But nowadays, the cooling fan is controlled externally to maintain a constant engine temperature. Some fans are controlled either with a thermostatic switch by the engine computer, and they turn on when the temperatures of the coolant gets above a set point. Turn back off when the temperature drops below. There's also a separate circuit for the heating system. This circuit takes fluid from the cylinder head and passes it through a heater core, then back to the pump. The heater core, located in the dashboard of your car, is really a little tiny radiator. The heater fan blows the air through the heater core into the passenger compartment of your car and keeps you warm. The heater core draws its coolant from the cylinder head and returns it to the pump so it works regardless if the thermostat's opened or closed. If your car is overheating, you can turn on the heater and it can pull hot air from the engine compartment and cool off your engine. I, I'm sorry, everybody. I can't do this anymore. I got a confession to make, something I've been hiding for at least several minutes. Well, here it goes. Liquid is not the only way to cool an engine, and I created a human-dolphin hybrid in my lab. Oh, 
that feels so good to get off my chest. So yeah, there's liquid-cooled engine and air-cooled engine. Technically, all engines are air-cooled because even water-cooled engines use air to cool the water. Mind-blowing, right? Well, pick your jaws up off the floor and I'm gonna go on. Air-cooled engines have fins extending out that pull heat away. Cool air is forced over the fins, typically by a fan. Those air-cooled Porsches and VW engines were boxer engines because they can expose more surface area to the air to cool them off. The explosions in the chamber aren't serving to warm up a huge solid engine block, just their own chambers. Also, they've got what amounts to essentially a fan in the engine to pull air through. And those crazy distinctive holes in the back and all around those old Porsches and bugs and vans, well, they're there to let as much air as possible in so that it can get around and through the engines. So if there's enough airflow, those dang old engines, they can last just about forever. These days, Air-cooled engines mostly show up in motorcycles, all-terrain vehicles, riding lawnmowers, and aircrafts. Personally, I got an air-cooled engine in my all-terrain riding lawnmower helicopter cycle. Join us in Who are you? It's me, Bart. Nerd engine. Turns out, I was just overheating. I put some coolant up inside me and boom! My glasses fell off and now I'm cool. Boy, I'll say you are. <laughs> You're the coolest engine I've ever seen. A nerd engine. Yes, Bart? Do you maybe want to go to prom with me? I thought you'd never ask. Woohoo! Full in an engine! Click this yellow button to subscribe to Donut. We got new shows coming out every day. You don't want to miss a thing. Ah, oh, check out Nolan's Wheelhouse and Air Cool Porsches. Check out this episode of Hot Lab. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Donut Media. Follow me at Bids Bardo. Go to shop.donut.media. We come up with a new piece of merchandise every dang week. Don't tell my wife I'm taking Nerd Engine to prom. <laughs>